Uh, Your Excellency, dear guests of the open lecture, colleagues and dear students. It's an honor and a great pleasure for me to welcome you here at the online lecture hall of Moscow Metropolitan Governance University. Uh, our university is a corporate university of the Moscow government. Hence, higher education, training for civil servants and HR projects are the three main fields of our work. The primary focus of the research and training at the university lies on city needs. That is why it is very important for us to give our students the broadest possible outlook on the processes that take place in modern cities of the world. No doubt, in order to work effectively, it is necessary to know the history of your own country along with the experience and modern practice of other countries and states. Um, however, to know doesn't mean to copy, but to enrich yourself with the experience of other countries and peoples. Today, it is especially important to be open to intellectual dialogue, keeping your integrity. Uh, we need to jointly seek and find the most effective ways of developing cities in the world. We must understand the realities of public service in the modern world. That is why our university upholds the training, the tradition of inviting leading experts in public administration and urban studies to present their ideas and share their experience. We remember the lectures of the ambassadors of the Czech Republic, Australia and Indonesia, as well as the lecture of the mayor of Helsinki. A series of lectures was also delivered by experts from Japan, Germany, Belarus, Italy, and uh, many other countries. Today, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Sri Lanka, Professor Dr. Uh, Migaland Lawansa, MD, will give a lecture on the topic public service in Sri Lanka, past, present, and future. Your Excellency, thank you for your uh, consent to meet the students of Moscow Metropolitan Governance University. At the end of the lecture, the students of the university will have time to ask their questions to His Excellency. My colleague, Associate Professor Yelena Pavlovna Popova, will be helping me to conduct our meeting. Their working language is English and translation is not provided. Your Excellency, you have the floor, so our students are all yours. Thank you. Drastiti, a very good uh, day to everybody. Um, thank you very much for that uh, excellent introductory note. When we visited your university, one of the best universities that I have heard of in the field of metropolitan governance, and the meeting that we had with the respected, the visionary, and the committed rector, Professor Vasily Fivescu, and also the vice rector, Alexei Alexandro, and also Mr. Alexei Ivanov. After very useful discussion to establish collaboration between Sri Lanka and Metropolitan Governance University, because that is part of the work of the embassy to establish university to university links between the two countries. I was invited to give a lecture to the bright students and some staff of your university on something which I thought I cannot talk about being in the medical profession and having engaged in administration, partly in the hospital sector and the university, I thought, what is there for me to talk about? If you are confronted with something that you do not know about, either you retract or 
you come forward and try to give a lecture by studying and also trying to correlate your experiences with theory. Of course, theory, you bright students know more than I know about. But certainly I would like to share some of the experiences, only few, and we have only about 45 minutes to uh, interact. And also uh, look at Sri Lanka and Russia and Sri Lanka-Russian relations a bit. And also how Sri Lanka public service system has geared up to manage the present crisis of COVID. When you are confronted uh, with a topic that you don't know much about, of course you study and you talk to people and you think about it and I had plenty of time and during that period and I learned uh, a fair amount. Uh, when you give a lecture, of course the seated is more strenuous because if you are standing and you can walk from one side to the other side of the lecture, you can ask a couple of questions from the student, you can buy time. But here I can't do any of those things or else the lecturers do not allow the students to ask questions or the lecturers behave as though that they are like the God or use some complex jargons to distract the attention of the students so that the students think that the lecturer is very knowledgeable. I do not do any of those things and I thought during the discussion that we will have an opportunity to learn from each other. Respected Director, thank you very much for this opportunity that you have given me to interact with your students and the university. At the bottom of the slides that I have given my kind of a bio, just to indicate to you that what I am talking will be centered around my experience gained from being head of the Department of Surgery and also nursing subsequently and Dean Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, and also the founder Dean, which was a very difficult task of a newly established university in, in Sri Lanka, and also being a consultant surgeon and president of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka, and currently, of course, as the ambassador and the president of the Sark Surgical Care Society and sitting and contributing at various committees and the councils and the quality improvements and all that, so probably I have little background to talk about my experience, therefore. All these experience come from, of course, by being in Sri Lanka, but uh, working with colleagues from outside the country. And I come from a place known as Kandy, a beautiful uh, university. And during the month of May, you can see uh, the, the trees with all the flowers. And this is a one, one of the best botanical gardens that you can think of in South Asian countries. And my strength, I think, have come from by been working in this university for last 30 years plus. What are the historical relations between Sri Lanka and Russia? About 180 years ago, two scholars, one professor and another artist visited Sri Lanka and they wrote extensively on Buddhism. And great Anton Chekhov visited Sri Lanka in 1890 and we recently issued a stamp to commemorate his visit. And the Nikolai II, the crown, visited a year later, he visited many parts of the country on the way from Russia through Bombay to Japan and back, back to Russia. And he has written a lot about his visit. And during the visits, two things happened, which are memorable. One is, one was a baby elephant was gifted for him to take from Kandy to Russia. Of course, the night before he left Colombo by ship, the baby elephant decided to run away and they were not able to catch the baby elephant. So Russia lost the baby elephant, but then he planted the tree in the beautiful, beautiful um, botanical garden I just mentioned. 
1891, and the, at the center is the tree that he planted, 60 feet tall tree in one of the most beautiful gardens, as I mentioned. So that Sri Lanka remembers Russia and Sri Lankan people have great affinity towards Russia. More recently, in 1957, we established diplomatic relations. This is the small embassy where I speak from you. And the relationships have grown in many spheres. And of course, now there are direct flights. Those days we did not have. And culture, science, education, trade, tea, tourism, military technical cooperation. And we work the two governments in all these spheres. What is most striking to Sri Lankan population is the gesture of the USSR at the time, starting from 1960, giving us scholarships for students, the medicine being very popular. At the moment, uh, Russia offers us about 40 scholarships. In addition to that, and there are a large number of students studying especially medicine in Russia on a living basis. At the moment, we have nearly about 1,000 students in main universities, Moscow, Tver, and Kursk included. Core principles of relationship between our countries, to last, to long last any relationship, one needs to adhere to basic principles. And I think that has shown very well between the mighty Russia and small Sri Lanka. Both countries accept the equality of states, independence of the states, respect for territorial integrity, no interference whatsoever, no interference in domestic affairs and a big country like Russia could do so very easily. And also Russia, like a elder brother, has assisted Sri Lanka when we needed it, when we had terrorism rampaging in Sri Lanka, Russia helped. And also when we had floods and the land slides, you readily provided all the aerial photos so that we were able to manage the humanitarian assistance to needy people. And very importantly, our interest, both at the bilateral level and also the multilateral organizations outside the two countries overlap so much. Therefore, we agree on almost all the issues. This is the two presidents meeting each other a couple of years ago. Of course, the former president of Sri Lanka meeting, uh, and he is the current prime minister. What is most important of this slide is that your foreign minister can speak Sinhala language, the main language of Sri Lanka. It is a matter for us to boast about and also for you to, uh, to understand it. But I think the most important thing is that he started his career as a young diplomat in Sri Lanka so that he worked hard to learn this somewhat difficult language. He has mastered it. He can speak and write. So so that he was able to get close to people in Sri Lanka. I think that is something that I learned from his commitment in Sri Lanka. So unfortunately, I cannot speak Russian. One day, hopefully, I'll be able to say what I am doing in simple terms in Russian language. Russia has always from a distance helping Sri Lanka. 2019 Easter Sunday, terrorists attacked several churches and hotels and, uh, in Colombo and also in Eastern Province. This was the carnage. Tourism went down and it was a Russian tourist a few weeks later who started coming first when the tourism, tourism started. And this is what your countrymen like in Sri Lanka most the sand, the sea, sunlight, and also sea fish. Indian Ocean, which is so discussed about in the world arena today, is of course 
is around Sri Lanka and we are at the tip of tip here and many naval vessels and both military and commercial pass just below the tip of the South Pole. So therefore the Indian Ocean is important to Sri Lanka but it is important to the whole world and the Russian presence in the Indian o Ocean gives us a balance of various powers activity. Now you might wonder, having been a doctor and a um, medical academic and also the administrator, what am I doing here? I also have asked that question a couple of times. His Excellency the President soon after appointment decided to send some professionals to the main cities in the world, Russia being one of the highly sought after city. It was a surprise and it took a couple of days for me to say yes or no. And then I spoke with, as usual, when you are confronted and you speak to somebody, I spoke to one of my mentors who is in uh, the UK, he's a Sri Lankan. It took as a surprise, he said, uh, do you check your horoscope? Because the Sri Lankans read their horoscopes when something is good or bad about to be happen. And then he asked the bad guy, the Saturn, where is he? So, and also he said, very good, but you look after your size and the back. That was one advice. This gentleman, again, a senior professor, one of my mentors in Sri Lanka, he said, he thought for a while, he said, you people have got the core working principles engraving you. Therefore, wherever you go, you will have a teething period and then you will do. This is one of the mentors and also a good friend of mine. He passed away only a couple of days ago in a candy again, a surgeon. By the way, he's a pediatrician. And he said, Lama, Russia is a friend, friendly country. You go and you can do it. And there was nothing. Then the COVID was there and this is also principle of management now COVID is there now I have been appointed uh, am I to come or just wait and give excuses no now going back to the Lord Buddha that is the kind of only religion that I know at least a little bit about and I'm not trying to impart religious knowledge uh, through this lecture but Lord Buddha 2600 years ago said if you want to be successful, start. Start without delay. So in the month of May, during the, the highest uh, peak of COVID, like a cosmonaut, I landed in Moscow. Before going to uh, the other experiences, uh, the Sri Lanka is uh, 22 million, one seventh of your population. Our life expectancy is very high at 77. Adult literacy rate, thanks to free education, is very high. Our GDP is just around 4,000 per capita. And main ethnic group is Sinhalese, but we live in harmony with the majority, but only uh, elements which are extreme only create trouble some time and again. Religions is likewise. and. Buddhist temples are there in everywhere, and so are the churches and the mosques and the Hindu Kovil. In Kandy, where I come from, actually, Hindu Kovil, the church and the mosque are located in the land belong to the Buddhist temple. School education is mandatory uh, until the age of 16, and the government provides free education. Something probably you did not know about, and we have got a very long history. And Sri Lanka here, there are a lot of caves in this part of Sri Lanka. And a uh, couple of decades ago, during the excavation, found this skeleton. And scientific analysis shows that, and this is a skeleton preserved, which is about 38,000 years old. And everything suggests that the man who lived at that time and would have been somebody like this. And these are more recent one, uh, just about um, one or two uh, hundred years before and after Christ. 
and they are well preserved these frescoes uh, and, and this is an old uh, construction to um, for venerating uh, Buddhist for veneration of the Buddhist. We are a small country, but we have been like the first or best in the world on several occasions. Uh, of course, and some of senior members will identify the, the respected uh, and eminent statement from Russia. First female prime minister in the world come from Sri Lanka back in 1960. And she became the prime minister twice more and her daughter, not really due to the due to her mother, became the president of the country. And Sri Lanka has produced Mrs. World twice back in 1985. And also this year, current year, the Mrs. World is from Sri Lanka. Now, uh, Sri Lanka has got uh, beautiful ladies, but uh, we have not produced single Miss World. And when they compete for Miss World, they are not, they are not winners. So the so the praise goes to the husbands that after they're getting married, husbands look after so well these ladies and they are able to become Mrs. World. Best tea come from Ceylon. The best cinnamon, this is the cinnamon tree. And this is the cinnamon and in various food items, buns and all that come from Sri Lanka. The best travel destination according to Lonely Planet in 2019 was Sri Lanka. We are among the 10 top most attractive destinations in the world. Small country, we beat all the other cricket uh, uh, teams in the world and was the champions in 1996. The most sacred place for Buddhists in the world where the tooth relics of the Lord Buddha is housed and through the generations well preserved is in this temple in Kandy. We are very famous for Jen and if you can recognize this lady, the late Diana and there's a blue sapphire from Sri Lanka and of course and uh, even the crowns of uh, prominent uh, uh, kings and the queens do have uh, the best blue sapphire from Sri Lanka. Coming back to the topic that you are more familiar, the levels of state in Sri Lanka. This looks more complex, but I'll just uh, highlight only one or two points to which is relevant for today's discussion. At the national level, we have the national government. The president is executive elected by people. And then there is a parliament again separately elected by people. And the president is is the uh, the head of the ministers, the cabinet of ministers. We have elections for presidency and the parliament at two different times. What we have had at least one occasion or at least two occasions where the president was from one party, the parliament and the ministers were from another party. And in both occasions, the management of the country did not go very well. At the provincial levels, at nine provinces, there are provincial councils. Again, they are separately elected. If a provincial council is not in line with the government which is in power, there isn't much conflict or friction and they tend to work closely with each other. Provincial Council was a, um, is not actually very popular, I would say, at least in some people in the country, because this was a byproduct of we trying to, um, we trying to solve the terrorist problem that we had over 30 years. This was back in 1987. We signed a, a MOU or other agreement with uh, India as part of it or extension of it and we had to have the provincial councils but the provincial council did not solve the terrorist problem and it, it had created more and some people think it is a white elephant and more people have to be paid than unnecessary uh, overheads. District levels we have got provincial structures and also the government agents and the district secretary, uh, secretaries appointed and they are responsible both 
to the local government, or rather provincial government sector, and the head, uh, the head of the state, and they work very closely with, with each other. And initially, there were some problems, but we don't see major, major problems at that level. And the most local level, we have got the heads and the councils and the departments, they are elected once again. And at the village level, there is one representative elected person here. And at the village level, again, there is what is known as, there are Grama Sevaka, that is the village level small um, government assistant. There are about 14,000 such government assistants and the small um, areas in Sri Lanka, villages in Sri Lanka. For each of that person, it's about 1,600 people to look after. And actually, he does a very good service even during the COVID, which I'll be talking about a little later. And they were the people who were able to tell who needs help, uh, who doesn't need help, and what kind of help is required. And also, all the government machinery actually worked through him in the respective villages. So that we were able to manage the COVID, both prevention, treatment, uh, and uh, looking after the social welfare. And thanks to the presence of these people at the community level. And actually, this is a more of an extension from our pre-colonial uh, practices, which I'll be touching a little later, I suppose. The basic facts, facts about Sri Lankan public service. Uh, we have 7% uh, of our population work as government employees, and that is popular because of the prestige um, and also the pension. Uh, but it's a very high figure compared to so many other countries. As a result, 45% of the government's revenue is spent on salaries and pension. Um, this is the breakdown. Probably it is not relevant that much here, but we have got a large bureaucratic layer. However, some people think that the apex, which is controlling the bureaucrat, could be better than what it is at present. Sri Lanka administrative service is the country's permanent bureaucracy. And uh, there is an entry exams each year and any young graduate compete whether you are a science or a medicine or engineering, anybody can compete and become an administrator. And uh, they are pretty much uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, figures. Uh, with the, irrespective of the changes of the government, they might change the where they work but they remain in their permanent uh, position. Public services largely control all the major appointments and transfers and, and so on. And also the disciplinary actions are coordinated by what is known as a public service commission in Sri Lanka and including the foreign service comes under this. Evolution of Sri Lankan public service, only very you know, basic point. Um, we had monarchical system before 1505 and three uh, colonial influences, Portuguese, Dutch, and the British. British left uh, only uh, 1948, but when they conquered Sri Lanka between this time, they formally established a public service with a meager eight staff but I would say that the main reason for establishing the public service at that time was to look after their interest. I would say not so much of the interest of the rural community in Sri Lanka. And there were reforms at various levels because public service was expanding and there was more demand later on to look after the interest of uh, poor peasants in Sri Lanka. And in 1948, after the Second World War, we became an independent country and subsequently public service expanded. This point, the public service, although expanded, probably did not, in my opinion, understand the ways and the nuances and the requirements of expansion because it was suddenly from a more colonial type to more local and national type. So probably whether 
we thought about what would it what would it be in another 10 or 15 or 20 years time i am not very sure the public service commission was established at this time and they were fairly independent but were under the control of uh, cabinet of ministers because these were the very early evolution of national public service Although we got independent in 1948 and we remain as a Commonwealth country in 1972, we introduced a Republic constitution and we became totally independent and public service at this time came directly under the cabinet of ministers with more influence by the cabinet and which today people think wasn't probably a good idea. Six years later, we changed from Republican constitution to an executive presidency, very powerful executive presidency, and introduced neoliberal economic reform. Experts in the field of public administration think that we suddenly introduced neoliberal economic reforms, but our public sector was not well prepared for this. As a result of all this, we have a, in Sri Lanka right now, has a mixed tripod system of public service contributed by pre-colonial, that is monarchical system, uh, colonial legacies, and some local inventions. And also lately we borrow from global reform some of the good practices. When you talk about the public service and it can be looked at from different angles, historical evolution will tell you where to go and learn lessons from that. To whom the public service is, sometimes the administrators think that it is for them, but it is not So the public service, that is to serve the public. So it should go to everybody in a country or community. And in Sri Lanka, 80% of our population is in rural areas. So whatever we do, we need to keep that in mind. And public service can certainly improve the economic prosperity of country, or it can collapse economic prosperity again. And it is said in countries like Sri Lanka, and if you improve the efficiency of the public sector, there could be an improvement of about 30% of economy by that alone. And another important thing during the COVID especially is that how does the public sector works during crisis? And these last few slides will talk about that. Politicization is something which people, politicians like it, public ser ser servants do not like it. Politicians say that the public servants do not go in line with the government strategies. And the public servants think that we know everything and why do we have this politician but the politicians say they are elected people they are representative so it's a very difficult dilemma all over the world and i don't think that we have found the ideals for this one but one thing is for sure um, if we don't manage the public sector properly if we don't have an efficient public sector that certainly can have political consequences and at the elections uh, the people will look at how the country has managed uh, during the tenure. Something which is not happening, I think, in many of the countries is the correct assessment of the performance of the public sector. And uh, that cannot be one off thing, and it has to be an ongoing thing. And at least in the South Asian countries, I haven't seen reports of this being attended on, as an ongoing thing so that you incrementally improve the public sector. We can compare the models between countries and of what I have seen here in Russia, you have got a multi-layered, very beautiful and consistent level, uh, levels of administration so that you can anticipate what is going to happen and you have a person to talk to uh, and also they know what to do. So I, I think you have, you have a system, at least to the extent that I have seen, working very well. And also like what I am doing, and one can talk about the public service from one's own experience. Now, my experience come from, one thing is, we will say I was a founder dean of a university known as Wyambe University. And uh, no buildings, 
no lecturers, no curriculum. I was alone and the students were to come in just um, three and a half months time. These are the innocent kids who came to the university. So I worked nearly two years there and before I, I took up this position as ambassador. So we, we did, of course, a lot of work. I don't want to, and these are the, the buildings at the time that I left. And of course, many people worked hard to achieve that one. And of course, and I really admired the way students work. And I had the opportunity of using my experience to groom these students. And this faculty right now is doing very well in the country. And uh, away from home, a lot of traveling, and um, economically not advantageous to me. And sometimes the problems come and several times and I ask myself, what am I doing here? I was invited by the highest body of the university administration in the country to do this. But then I thought I have come here for a purpose. I should not go back halfway through. I must continue. That is the second uh, principle that I would like to refer from Lord Buddha's teaching about the principles of management. For you to become successful, you should just continue. So that I continued. And I have been a surgeon and I am a surgeon uh, throughout my life or rather for the last 30 odd years. What are the lessons that I have learned by being a surgeon, which is relevant today. When I was a student, we had the professor of surgery. And I think he gave some hint to what the public servants should be. He said, one needs to be honest, hardworking, cleanliness, because he was a surgeon, I think he was more worried about, you know, we taking infections to the operating theaters and all that. He did not expect us to know the latest theories about medicine, but he wanted us to be honest, work hard. And we were not able to digress away from this one. And also time and again, and he checked our general knowledge. And also, especially when he is angry and, and he tried to check our general knowledge because medicals are generally poor in their general knowledge because they read a lot on other things. While once he was operating and he asked about some medical question, we were not able to answer. Then he said, I say, you don't know anything medicine and you don't have general knowledge. Just tell me what is the longest railway line in the world? He did not expect anybody to answer this one. If I if I knew anything about Russia, that was the only thing I knew at the time. And I said, sir, Trans-Siberian uh, Railway. And he just looked at my face because he was there to shout at us saying that we don't know anything about. Now he could not shout at me. And then he said the next question, I said, from where to where? So I said from Vladivostok to Leningrad at the time and in, in broken English. And then uh, he just looked at me and had a sarcastic smile and he continued. On that day, I did not think that. And I would be, I would be related to that, relating that experience with some group of bright students and academics here as an ambassador in Moscow. And there are similarities between the decision making that we do as a surgeon and to the public sector. We look at when you see a patient, what to do for the patient, look at the patient needs, what you know, and always look at the patient's perspective. So as a surgeon, often we take a decision to operate on. And then how to operate, we learn and like how to, as an ambassador also, how to work. I had about one or two months before I, I came here. So I continued to study and spoke to people. And also surgeons went to operate. There is a time and you, you don't do it very early, especially in bad leal patients and you don't delay it. So those are very critical decisions you have to do in one's life. It is like chess games and which your country is so, popular, so famous about. And there are some time when you have to delay the moon, sometimes you have to sacrifice and do. And also, as you mature, you understand when not to operate. So as an ambassador also, there are things that you do uh, in a hurry. There are things that I keep on the table. And after thinking through this over and over again, 
sometimes the good ideas come and sometimes we discard those ideas and don't proceed with them. My specialty being a general surgeon and uh, I established the first kidney transplant program for children in the country. And um, what I'm trying to uh, show here, I don't know whether it is acceptable to some of you all, only one or two slides of this one. For a child, there are no children who can give kidneys. You have to take a kidney from an adult. You say these are the two kidneys in adult and we have to make a cut here and take this kidney carefully with the ureter, the tube which is draining the urine down here. So all these things have to be done very meticulously carefully and we can't have any complications in the person who is giving the kidney. He's otherwise a normal person. Then you have to carefully with ice cold saline, flush the kidney so that kidney survives for a longer period while you are doing surgery in the little, on the little child. Then you keep it in the ice for some time while you are preparing the child. And this is the kidney. Uh, some of the slides I was asked to remove yesterday. This is the kidney and this is the ureter. This is the head end of the patient child and this is the tail uh, leg end of the child this is the right and this is the left so these are the small blood vessels that we have very carefully sutured the whole procedure might take from about six to uh, eight hours generally about seven to eight hours so this is the uh, larger version of we cool the kidney to get rid of all the blood and so on uh, from the kidney and this is a very nice kidney. This is a larger version of uh, surgical operations completed. This is a very carefully made uh, plumbing between the blood vessels. This one is a vein, this one is an artery. And the first child was done in 2014 and a very small one. And this is the smallest we did. And at the time and the world was not doing very, very tiny ones, only eight kilograms and one year and 10 months. And both are happily alive. And this girl is a businesswoman now she is uh, schooling. And uh, recently we gathered uh, the children who are easily accessible. And this is a gentleman who helped us from Sri Lanka from the UK. And these are the children and it is very happy. Generally, when I do things in my life and somebody asks me, are you enjoying your life as embedded? I said, I'm doing what I think is right and I will know whether I'm a happy man or not at the end of my work. So that I can say that it was, although it was strenuous and we, we kept on going, as I said, this Lord Buddha's principle and we see otherwise all these children would have been no more with us. So the it was not a rosy picture for any public servant and there were a lot of resistance coming. Nobody was doing it and uh, some people are not cooperating and sometimes criticism and uh, but we continued. And once you start, what the Lord Buddha has said is don't get distracted. There will be people whom you who don't like you. And, uh, but don't get distracted, but stay firm. This is not the first time that I had to stay firm over a period of time as administrator. There were several major issues which went to the national level. And then I thought that I was right and I took the firm decision. I will stay with those decisions. And that had paved the way. Uh, and of course, all the decisions have come uh, as right. So that as a public servant, uh, we need to stay firm with the right decisions we take and without giving in to, to pressures from various people. And of course, that amounts to the family. Also, sometimes the family pressures come, but uh, unfortunately, and um, you have to resist that also. What surgery has taught me is to work long hours, sometimes only a glass of water, take risks and work as a team and fast decision making when it is required and the other times and to be very cautious. Attention to details, you can't do a transplant without attention to details. That is what I'm doing here in the embassy. And also the plan ahead 
and looking at the final outcome. Let me explain this one. Uh, we, um, you know, we operate on cancer patients and all that, and we will say I get a patient who's suspected of breast cancer today seen. I know this is very likely to be breast cancer. This lady needs surgery, surgery. One way of doing it is, okay, I order a scan, blood test, and, you know, stepwise go on. You do one after finishing the next. Then you don't have any plans, and things get dragged. But that was some time we did when I was very young. But later on, I realized, no, the moment I see, I discuss with the patient, I said, surgery is in, in 10 days' time. So that my junior team has to work hard, and they have to beg go bribe or do anything but get the patients onto the operating table on the day that i decide so it works so that principle i'm using in the embassy and also in my other administrative work sometime and such deadline seems to be too harsh but uh, that works very well uh, in most of the time leaders should show self-confidence and confidence on the confidence of others on the leader as well. That doesn't come automatically, and you have to lead them. And the, this is not a lecture on uh, how to um, view leadership, but you should not take hasty decisions, which you have to uh, retract. And one of the most important things that I have done in my life is, and my staff under me, I'm very critical, and I, I cut them into pieces and try to improve them and with whatever the, the skills that I have, but I always and always protect my staff, whether it's in the hospital or the university or the embassy staff and from external threats. And also very often, and however sometime not good the certain things they may be, I tell the whole world you know, how good they are. And of course, one needs to look into their welfare, at least give a patient listening to them. Um, the listening has to be very active and also one need to understand your strengths and weaknesses. You always keep on reminding and talking with you so that you improve, you keep on improving. And before I came here as ambassador, I actually did this one. What are the strengths that I have? What are the weaknesses that I have during the two months that I had and also in early part of my, my life here, I try to address my weaknesses and also while maximizing the strength to gain the best for my country. And uh, sometimes what I have learned is and making even a small change in the embassy that we have done, few small structural and functional changes and they have a big impact. And uh, when you are working as a team and the leader can go through stresses and also the juniors also go through stresses, you as a leader need to de-stress yourself and also de-stress the others. And when I find that somebody is under stress and depending on the person's understanding that I have, there are various ways that I try to help the person to de-stress. When I am stressed in my office, what I often do is to take a walk, maybe a few steps this way, that way, and um, that helps me. We decentralize, and that I have done in the embassy. Specific duty lists have been given. There is a professional code of conduct for everybody. And we train each other, we talk to each other, and my room is open at any time for anybody to walk in, so that we take participatory decision making very often and that is part of the training that you do and also most importantly every item that we initiate is being followed up and we have established a mechanism for that then understanding your team and identifying different traits i read this one long time ago uh, actually when i was flying from sri lanka to somewhere in a journal in any organization, whether it is small or large, about 15 to 20% of your staff are game changers. They are the real changes of your organization. There are those people who with just negative attitudes and they will have all the reasons not to do good piece of work. And then there are 
others who are who could be very destructive and there are others bulk which are as usual they continue with the with the work and large organization you can tolerate to a large extent this negative and destructive category but in small organizations you find it very difficult because even one person who is destructive or negative can have a large impact on the organization then the like in a embassy in a small organization task of balancing smooth and effective functioning of the organization is somewhat difficult because you are you have a small community to work because there are peculiarities of people and you got to understand all of them and also understand the differences and we need to respect the differences but but of course uh, not to take that forward where you end up with some personal animosity and sometimes i have seen both large and the small organization the personal animosities are there but i don't allow them to surface to disrupt the function of the organization as a leader you can't be very close you can't be far away from them either so that the leader has to strike a balance but the most important thing what i have told my my staff here in the embassy is you identify the institutional goal so if there is a difficult decision for me to take i look at what is the institution is expected to do to improve the relationship between the two countries then it is very easy for me to take a decision the achieving embassy goals uh, there are three uh, categories involved the embassy staff sri lankan agencies and the russian entities and i think all three categories know clearly what the embassy is trying to do and i am very happy to say that the russian entities wherever i have contacted whenever i have contacted they have helped me so this comes to the fifth principle of lord buddha's teaching always give a clear message to people around you so then they work according to the clear message um generally we we can concentrate only for 20 minutes and probably um it will be 220 minutes um i will just uh, break the monotony um if you haven't read this earlier this is very relevant to uh, administration and the public service the story of finding five idiots akbar the king this is coming from indian history asked berber to look for five biggest idiots in his state and produce them in his court within a month i don't know why he wanted to look for idiots after a month's extensive search operation the berber who is supposed to be intelligent brought to the court only two persons he couldn't find five idiots but then the akbar said i asked for five men berber said sir give me a chance to present them one by one berber pleaded and went on to present his idiots the first man while traveling in a bullock cart he was seated in a bullock cart he was keeping his luggage on his head so as not to hurt the bullocks there is no purpose of doing this one because the, the same weight only he was hurting his head and the neck and this is not proper decentralization so he was doing a very useless piece of work so that's the first idiot finding the second and the third idiot pointing to the second man berber continued this man here is the second idiot some grass grew on the roof of his house that's at his house and he was trying to force his cow climb up a ladder to graze on them one thing is man is lazy and he think that the cow can uh, climb up the ladder he is getting a person to do something that the person cannot do so he is the second idiot third idiot maharaja there were a lot of important jobs for me to do in this state one month i have wasted i ignored my work and search for idiots according to me for me to keep on looking for idiot i am the third idiot now the fourth and the fifth are waiting um 
I don't think I'm going to go through the public service reforms and I'll be running short of time, but let me go through the management of COVID now. Public service is so important during crisis period. Sri Lanka experienced crisis like flood and landslides, which Kashya helped us. We had terrorist war insurgency going on for 30 years, very brutal, including child soldiers against all the international uh, standards. And towards the latter part of the war, this, is, this side is where the Sri Lankan uh, armed forces were there. This side where the tigers kept innocent civilians as hostages, human shields. They decided to cross the lagoon. Tigers from back actually shoot at some of them and they got killed because they did not want these innocent Tamil civilians to live. And in addition to that, they were bombing this area where the government troops were. So that we had a lot of crisis in our country and the latest is of course, the COVID. The, the fourth idiot story comes to the management of COVID than if we are not careful. Berber said to Maharaja, you are the king and are responsible for the well-being of the entire state of and its people. You need wise person to help you oversee the state affairs. Instead of looking for wise people, you engage me to look for idiots. According to me, sir, you king is the fourth idiot. Fortunately for us, the country is led by a visionary who looks for able people to do the job. And he took over the management, uh, crisis management of COVID to his hand. And he categorically told everybody in the world, our governments, inclusive, non-discriminatory and holistic measures are key to saving lives and protecting people's health. He actually practiced that to date. He got not ideas and a group of people who are able to contribute. Actually, according to the United Nations um, principles, we need to have strategic thinking and planning amidst chaos. The president was able, is able to do that one because he was the one who managed the last five years of war and he had to take very, very sharp decisions during the chaos. And Collaboration and network leadership is something that he is quite used to. And he appointed good leaders. And this is the Honorable Lady Minister of Health. And this gentleman is the Director General of Health Services, who is a Russian graduate and who is the topmost civil servant, the second topmost uh, civil servant in, in health sector, who managed the COVID uh, crisis very effectively. So uh, the Russia is reminded, of course, he was promoted as a, a permanent bureaucrat and a secretary to environmental ministry now. Managing crisis and uh, you need to uh, keep your, uh, you need to keep your um, public services going and the COVID management center has taken a serious note about it. And these are some of the publications related to continuity of public services, whether it is water, electricity, power, essential services, or whatever. Then the uh, why is that this is not uh, moving? Right. Um, it is so important for us to uh, inform the public website was initiated very early and to keep the public with the government is a massive task and all over the world the frustration and uh, protests have come because of the failure to to um, failure to uh, understand each other and to get the public cooperation and the correct language needs to be used in these posters from city officers sometime and we develop uh, uh, posters which are good for us but not for poor people. Their welfare needs to be taken and the plenty of money was distributed but it was not a, 
uh, practice that you can continue forever and that is something which people tend to uh, uh, tend to make uh, to to uh, understand the government and also the united nations actually they publish the sacrifice made by people in sri lanka in this article they put their service before self and going an extra mile and we have seen such people uh, even in this country and i know one of the sri lankan doctors actually unfortunately was elderly man passed away in, uh, while managing covid and uh, quick thinking and creativity was needed both at the administration level these are also again a un requirement or kind of a principle and soon our apparel industry the garment or the textile sector started making uh, masks and also the shields and also our nanotechnology helped us to develop within a very short period of time the soaps to collect samples for pcr testing and uh, resource allocation and distribution and accountability is very important and the government has to build and enhance state legitimacy and the government credibility and then only we have the people trust we had two problems at the time already the parliament had been dissolved by the president the covid was there the parliament was to be uh, re recommence after elections the election commission had to postpone the election so there was a kind of a vacuum and fortunately we had the president who was uh, elected and uh, with a cabinet and and he continued until the next elections was held in august uh, of course there was argument for and against on this matter but uh, but um, i think those are things which i think was faced by some other countries also able to have elections or not during this period um we controlled the covid uh, very well i think the initial phase but the income from migrant workers tourism we get about 80000 tourists from uh, russia every year but still they are waiting to actually enter sri lanka once the borders open and apparel sector there was a downturn but we picked up a bit and the tea although um, there was an initial drop tea is doing very well uh, at the moment in uh, all the markets the russia is the uh, russia among the top markets uh, iraq iran turkey russia are uh, very um, high end markets couple of more slides only and i'll be finishing and if people have not left already from march we had only very small number of uh, covid cases since we had to revive the economy certain measures were taken at this point then there was second wave came up and we have by this time we had only about uh, 4000 cases now we have just uh, about 30000 cases and uh, i think we have we are getting good control of the second wave now and uh, no sooner that we should be able to maybe in about another 3 or 4 weeks time the government is planning to open the airport for uh, inbound tourism um i think our measures by and large if you look at this one the distribution of covid uh, as a um, uh, the case load in the countries very high case load you can see in this dark color and these are the intermediate color ones and in sri lanka actually is still fairly low as a percentage so so that is the the country has been able to achieve something and the deaths um this i think i got about two or three days ago from uh, the international figures 2.67% in brazil of the people who were affected with covid and sometime and people say okay there are a large number of people who were not tested therefore this is actually a very uh, artificially high number but this is what the world has reported and the sri lanka is fairly low number and we have got thousands and thousands of doctors working on this one and several thousands are products of uh, russia and um, hopefully um, your vaccine sputnik v is going to help not only russia and sri lanka and i believe and um, then comes the sixth principle of lord buddha um what he said is you can think of doing anything you can start anything but unless 
you strategize wisely and cleverly, the outcome may not be that good. This is some time where I have failed in my life and no time to discuss all that. And one needs to understand that you need a strategy. This man is trying to help, but they don't understand and shy away. Now, um, how do you find the fifth idiot of that story? Ladies and gentlemen and the, the respected director, if you invite me again, sadly, I will let you know, according to this story, who the fifth idiot is. But uh, I would like to share this slide and a uh, lot of good things happening in Sri Lanka. They, these things are actually common to Sri Lanka and Russia, some of them. And the culture goes on despite all the pandemic. Thank you very much. And um, thank you uh, for giving me this uh, opportunity uh, once again. I'm open to any questions or criticism um, on, on the things that I have said. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your really interesting talk, informative speech, and lots of students are eager to ask you many questions. I hope uh, that uh, they will not get upset if the turn will not come to each of them, but we will try to cover as many as we can. So uh, now, uh, I want to turn the floor over to Ali Nikovandalana, the fourth year student of Moscow Metropolitan Governance University, Foreign Affairs Department. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Thank you for your presentation. Your country is really very interesting. I was there several years ago. So as you mentioned already, our countries have deep uh, tradition of cooperation. And from your point of view, in which uh, sphere areas uh, our country should cooperate more? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. And your country is doing actually what I have expected. Um, the, we need to get people to people contact. That is the most important thing I would say. And for that one, one way is doing these uh, university to university contacts. And these also people to people contact in a sense. Uh, so the universities, about four or five universities already have established very strong links for research, education, academic work, all that. And uh, I, if more universities from Russian side help me, and that would be uh, very good. And I, I am sure the Metropolitan Governance University is going to do that one. Then uh, cultural relationships. And uh, there are, you are a culture savvy, savvy country, and you respect the cultures of the others. Uh, so how do we link our cultural uh, organization uh, between the two countries? And um, science, and you have a lot of good science and technology which you can share with Sri Lanka. How do we get there? Already one uh, agriculture scientific center in course has agreed to work with Sri Lankan scientific uh, community. So that kind of a thing. And of course, we would like you to buy more Ceylon tea we would like you to send more tourists to Sri Lanka. Uh, and something which has come very good, recently we inaugurated the Sinhala language course for Russian citizens. We wanted to do it in a very small scale. We thought there would be about five or six uh, students. And to my astonishment, then we have 100 students learning Sinhala language. Embassy is coordinating with the university in Sri Lanka, conducting online, online uh, uh, language four months course in Sinhala. So that if respected universities also look at these things and how do we, and the organizations, how do we improve people to people contact, the trade, the tea, tourism, they are actually byproducts. Uh, that is what I would like most from uh, Russian uh, entities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, students, please raise your hands. Be can, yeah, be more active. I see that yeah, there are pretty many. So uh, now it's um, time to hand over the word to Gurchin Lilian. Please, it's your turn to ask a question. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you, thank you for a very comprehensive and a very interesting report on on Sri Lanka and 
political life of Sri, of Sri Lanka. It was a very interesting information, and I would like to and I would like to ask the following question: Do national traditions uh, play a, play a big role in, uh, in establishing relations between between Sri Lanka and foreign states? Mm. Can you elaborate a bit? What do you mean by national tradition? Um, maybe uh, national traditions um, mean uh, the principles of of the Lord Buddha. Oh, I see. Right. Oh, I, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think the answer is yes and no. And uh, when we have a country where the Buddhism is practiced, we have relationship related to Buddhism. That's true. But the countries where the Buddhism is not practiced, very difficult to find a country where the Buddhism is not practiced, but still we have a very, very good relationship. We don't just say this is not a Buddhist country and therefore we don't uh, have an intensive relationship with them. So that doesn't affect us. And of course, um, we have Buddhism, Hindus, Islam, and the Christians. So uh, our, our country uh, has all those religions. So I think that that is that probably have I answered your question? Yes, yes, thank you for your answer. I, I understood. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, since we still have some few minutes, please um, let me call on the Polyona Vandaria. Please ask your question. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you for your great presentation. Um, I, I've learned a little bit more about your country. And my question is, what are the requirements to hold a position at public services? All right. Um, it um, depends because the public service has got various levels. But if you want to go up the ladder as a to become a senior administrator, minimum you need is a degree from a university. You call it a diploma in this country. Now, um, I would give you an example. Now, uh, police is also a public service. And you have various levels in the police. And uh, junior level people do not need a, uh, need a degree qualification. Uh, but of course, there will be training after they join. But for higher levels, they need a, a, a degree uh, qualification. Um, then if you look at nursing, it's also public service. You don't need the degree, but you need the training. But there are degree holders also. Um, now, my staff here, I'll, I'll tell you, I think uh, now I have got below me diplomatic officers. They are degree holders and also they have been trained in the foreign service. Then uh, there are others at a lower level who work as management assistants, we call them. It is not necessary for them to possess a university degree, but most of them do have those. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you, Your Excellency. And probably the last uh, question to you today, uh, Zibarov Alexander, I'm turning the floor over to you. Um, dear Excellency, um, so thank you for your wonderful presentation. And my question is, uh, um, what features can you highlight in the work or with our country? My work in this country? Yeah, right. yes. Oh, uh, that is a very um, interesting question. And I think you will get a good understanding of almost all of our work. If you go to the embassy website and we have monthly newsletter, everything is there, what we have done. And um, uh, from the time that I came here, I had to interact with the uh, officials of Minister of Foreign Affairs and also culture, education, all of them, because there are a lot of activities that we are collaborating between the two countries. And also um, I have paid a courtesy call on the Metropolitan Hilarion and a very nice encounter to share views and how to uh, improve the maximum 
gain, uh, uh, how to get the maximum gain from my stake here. And, uh, and we are concentrating on the activities in Moscow, whether it is trade, tourism. Then we went to St. Petersburg. We met the city government of St. Petersburg. They are very happy to uh, improve the established, established links. And actually uh, tomorrow, no, not tomorrow. Uh, yeah, tomorrow, uh, last week, we had a, a trade meeting with the St. Petersburg uh, business uh, community, a Chamber of Commerce. And um, when we were there in Kunskama, you know, the Kunskama Museum has got a section on Sri Lanka as well. And they have written heavily on Sri Lanka. So we are now, we have established uh, a working kind of a relationship between our museum, the, the National Museum in Sri Lanka with Kunskama Museum. And uh, with St. Petersburg, the doctors who are treating um, COVID, uh, we are having a meeting with Sri Lankan doctors uh, uh, next week so that they share the ideas and learn from each other. And also I had the opportunity of visiting five or six big hospitals, including Hospital 52 here and who are treating uh, COVID patients. And I learn a lot from them. And also we have established some working link with, especially with uh, clinical hospital 52 and uh, a hospital in Sri Lanka, not just in COVID, but allergy, immunology and uh, nephrology, things like that. And also we went to Kursk. We spent, uh, my team, uh, six or seven of them spent about a week in Kursk. Despite the pandemic, we had a cultural show in open uh, park, and then we met with uh, scientific centers. We visited agriculture uh, mushroom farm, and a uh, lot to learn from there. And then actually, we have written to Sri Lanka. If there's anybody who's interested in, and they can actually come and you know uh, uh, visit uh, the mushroom, how how they produce. We're one of the very big biggest mushroom facilities here. Universities and research centers. Uh, and also we had our Sri Lankan students in Kursk, about 300 of them. We had an embassy cricket tournament there and a lot of Russian students came and a um, lot of academic staff. And we had a tea degustation session there in the linear supermarket. We were supposed to go and do it in other linear, but because of the COVID situation now, and we have been told not to do that. Uh, and also uh, next week, uh, we will be going to Chuasia to meet the, the dignitaries there. So we have identified several regions in Russia to go and work with them. I think that probably give you in nutshell the kind of work that um, we are doing. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, dear guests, dear students, uh, thank you all for the active participation and bringing really topical and thought-provoking issues for the discussion. Uh, Some uh, probably Zlobin um, Oriana uh, can try the other word. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, on behalf of the students of Moscow City Government University, thank you a lot for this lecture. Uh, we got a unique opportunity to expand our knowledge about your country. It is really interesting. Uh, thank you again, Your Excellency. Uh, for taking the time in your busy schedule to meet with us. It is, it is my pleasure and, um, and hope to see you. If there's any question, you can actually send to the embassy um, email, which is there in the website, and we will answer if there are some pending questions. Thank you very much and have a, have a good day. And that's it, Daniel. Thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, dear Vasily Yurevich, may we ask you to close our meeting? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you for your lecture and your answers. I'm very pleased to thank, uh, to thank you for your visit to our university in November and for today's meeting with our students. Uh, let me express the hope that with your consent, the lecture materials will be published in our journal, Herald of the University of Moscow Government. Allow me to express my appreciation and gratitude to all of you for the participation. Thank you very much. Our meeting has come to an end and I wish you all the best. Goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you.